In full disclosure, this conversation was never intended to become a podcast episode. At the time of the recording, I had COVID. I didn't feel good. I probably didn't sound good. I didn't look good. But that's not what's important. What's important is the conversation. Justin has been a major part of the sign spinning lore and an even bigger part of Arrow's mythology. I chose to push record because I didn't want to lose some of those meaningful moments that would have otherwise evaporated into the ether. I feel privileged to have worked with him, and I'm humbled to call him a friend. What you're about to hear is just a conversation between two friends trying to understand their craft and understand the modern world around them. That being said, in regards to some of the topics we bring up, maybe we don't know what the hell we're talking about. But if you enjoy this conversation, drop a like, click subscribe, and connect with me on Instagram at the Spin Industry Podcast. Now, with the words of Justin, I'm just going to do this. You know, I got one that's a little worse than a robbery. Mm. It's actually killing people. So these fools oh. are selling like anti 5G pendants. Oh, yeah. And they're radioactive. Yeah. It's not the first time that's happened either. There's been a variety of like health products that were contaminated by otherwise harmful chemicals Dude, that's, that's so interesting because like you know anti-5g it's like what i don't even know what that is but the fact that they came to the conclusion that so, first of all how do you get radioactive substances second you're like <laughs> you're you're marketing it like the level i don't know man it's like what happens when a conspiracy theorist like gets investment capital <laughs> like oh real shit dude i've been seeing a lot of uh like anti 5g beanies or, or clothing that's supposed to protect you from radio waves and you I know just, just get this polonium off alibaba real quick it, that's another <laughs> thing like how how are they sort and not to mention the people that are working on it packaging it uh making these things it reminds oh, me of the uh, radium girls oh yeah dude i, I that is such a that's such a weird, sad, like, yeah. Like it's the... happening today. Well, I mean, without the radium, but still. Yeah. Same, same idea. Yeah. Um well, shit. Um not to jump base on you though. Yeah, you may as well do an intro. <laughs> <laughs> Safety glasses on. Yeah, that's kind of the reason why I wanted to get you on is uh, because I, I don't know anybody else who knows the language of sign spinning at your level. Well, that, that's the that's the uh, that was the first thing I did in 2004 was because before I started, there wasn't um, a, a clear definition of what a spin, a flip and a twist was. Yeah, that th that was the first thing I did was like, what's the difference between a turn of the wrist? and a twist of the wrist hmm. you know like what's the difference between uh, this and this you know so like that was literally the first thing i did was try to establish a baseline of spin is z-axis flip is x-axis and uh and twist is y-axis like that because it wasn't, I mean, and that's why you see the basketball flip being weird <laughs> hmm. because, because it was named prior to, uh, uh, <laughs> prior to my, uh, uh, uh diction <laughs> defining of it all the, prior to your intervention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And I think 
I think it's very realistic to describe sign spinning in terms of dance rather than visual art. I mean, people, it's like the general public has trouble assessing like the, in a critical way, what art is, you know, and, and how like, and the underlying theory of all of it and and like why why certain paintings can bring people to tears and why certain dances make people laugh and like uh and why certain sign spinning is more effective than others you know why why uh what the role of like you know for for music what's the role and in visual art what's the role of the rest what's the role of the negative space what's the role of presentation all of those things are like you know the absence the negative space but it's also some of the most essential parts to art yeah it's no more true than in stand-up comedy too those moments oh, of silence yeah. are sometimes really important yeah the the setup and and the explanation and the cadence like you know there's no discussion about cadence in sides but <sighs> You know, it's interesting that you mentioned cadence because uh, Jessica, she she actually said uh, she was asking about timing and um, what our relationship to timing is. I, I would argue that there is a, a small relationship to timing because um, often we're, we're focusing on timing lights or sometimes our timing is based on on reaction, like how we perform in a timely manner is, is based on am I receiving feedback from this particular person or am I going to pause and, you know, allow for a reading of the sign? Yeah. Um, but that's, that's like, that's more like a length rather than an interval. Um, and I mean, like you might, and also like, you know, it's, it's never been exact. Like I personally count, like I, I, I would keep counts in my head. Like I would know whether an intersection was 25 seconds or 30. Yeah. You know? And I mean, the crosswalk will, will cheat for you, but like, uh, nobody's, it's not, it, I mean, and that's dude, choreography. Yeah. There's, there's a reason oh. that Georgetown was the only choreography we ever did. <laughs> um, she was calling our, uh, our performances uh she or at least she compared them in, in the in her world what we do is comparable to a uh oh my god what what does she call it Routine. an improvisational score improvisational score yeah where you can teach somebody like you teach the theory is you teach somebody like four or five dance moves right and they can use these dance moves in any pattern or series that they want and it'll still look good with the song Right. It'll still look like they're knowing what they're doing. And um, the reason why she compared us to or our routines to an improvisational score is because that's exactly what we do. Sometimes we're, we're learning trick by trick and then piecing them together in our own way, the same way you would otherwise learn words and piece together your own sentences or learn notes and piece together your own chord progressions. I, I mean, I just think it's been entirely underdeveloped. Uh, I think that 90% of sign spinners couldn't spin to a beat if they tried. Fair. The, the focus on regularity is out. What do you mean? Um, about uniformity, about doing, doing a trick the same way, the same time, every time. doesn't matter. I don't know. I, I obviously I'm speaking from a, um, one foot in one foot out kind of perspective. You're not wrong though. Cause if I'm not mistaken, that was the whole basis of souls or Saul's conceptual art is just to give somebody instructions and however they interpret it is how they interpret it. And so whenever we teach somebody how to do a blender, as long as they're more or less doing it, however they interpret it is how they interpret it. Right. Yeah. And like, I mean, God, it like there's, in order for it to be transmitted, it has to have a certain rigidity. Like if you have to, if you have no container 
and you have to get a hundred gallons of water from somewhere to somewhere else, the best thing to do is freeze it, <laughs> but it's going to melt along the way. <laughs> I was actually talking with uh, Jacob today about, um, about this and how I like, I have come to terms that I never, I mean, obviously I don't think anybody would, would assume this, but like, uh, I don't belong to the new school of tech, even though like, you know, a lot of the stuff that like a lot of the tricks that I created, like ended up in there. Um, I don't belong to it because it is separated from its functional use as an advertising tool it's like you know you got your rafts and your tylers and your jacobs who are literally happier spending in their backyard than on at work they'd rather yeah. they'd rather spend for five hours for free than go and do it out there and i think that's actually what defines new school tech is that it's not for an audience it's for itself I, I've often said that too, where a lot of these tricks, sometimes they're so nuanced that only a science spinner would be able to appreciate the, the difficulty yeah. of what they're doing. Um, and, and that's the thing is that like, you know, it, when you, when you truly strip like, uh, Alex Rios has never spun a shift. And I think that is like, what does that mean? Like, uh, as a sign spinner, that's the most pure you can be. Like you have no concept of, of doing it. Like, you know, we, like I've only in, in my 15 years, I got one complaint, uh, which was at the, the museum on w Wilshire. I think, you know what I'm talking about? They did that, uh, animal poop exhibit or whatever. No. <laughs> and uh it was about presentation she was like he's not showing the sign enough and i'm like you don't know what you're talking about but that was the only complaint i ever got in 15 years that i know of. and uh and so like when you are when science spending is separated from a client's expectation or a salesperson's like you know promising of what it is what is sign spinning? That's actually sign spinning. That's like subject verb sign spinning. No advertising. Nothing. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what's on it because they do it in the backyard. To like owls don't have credit. They don't go to. <laughs> they, they don't yeah. buy. They don't buy gym memberships. Squirrel squirrels don't go to KB homes. So it's like it's actually the most pure form. And I re I remember being frustrated by this, like hey, you're really good. We should get you out there so that these million dollar corporations can benefit from your talent. Yeah. And, and it turns out that it's actually a much more pure form of expression when you do it for nobody. And so this is actually a relatively new development. I think, I think it started. Uh, I think it started in like, 2015 or 2016 i don't know but uh i think there's like it's 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 strange because like there's a certain alienation that like pushes people to just explore it on their own you know and somehow i think that that is leading the sport not the sport the art of sign spinning i mean and it's debatable like we've definitely engineered it as a sport competitors winners losers teams practices all that mm. but was that necessary to run it as a business yeah as an art form as a as a means of expression that people can just find on the internet and do it themselves it's a very different it's a very different question and we'll honestly never know mm. It's um, it's definitely a recent thing. It's definitely a recent phenomenon to where people have found, um, I guess, a new sense of freedom. It's a, uh, it's interesting to bring it up the, the differences between spinning on the corner and then spinning at home because it, it kind of reminds me of how skateboarding 
supposed to be traditionally a means of transportation. And somebody <laughs> turned that into a means of expression <clears throat> through doing tricks, hitting lines, doing all kinds of shit with skateboard. Um, shit I mean, that's not wanna, exactly. You want to discuss that though? Is is that is I, I don't know enough about it, but I seem to recall like you know Dogtown Z Boys, all that hype from back in the day, like what 2013. Uh, it was an alternative to surfing, and it was like, well, we have hills, mm. so I don't know. I, I don't know if it like obviously surfing isn't a mode of transportation. <laughs> not, but boating not, is. Not not particularly effective. Nah. Uh, so uh, you know, maybe the transportation is the side effect of the expression then. But then, but then you think about what is surfing and like you know the spiritual like because people that invented surfing, there is definitely some spiritual religious significance about it. I don't think I I, I think that we like I think that there are people that still do it that way, but it's like the the merging with the ocean like you're standing on water and it's moving you smoothly and you're just having a good time like there's something there's something uh organic about that experience and then it gets turned to skateboarding so they're they're kind of using that same kind of force to go down hills and then and then when they get to the bottom, that's where the change happens is when you have to start pumping. Cause there's, mm. <laughs> yeah. From being at the mercy of the water to being at the mercy of gravity. Yeah. I mean like, you know, once, once you take it away from its original, that's, that's really interesting. Cause it's like, once you take skateboarding, you know, as it was originally conceived going downhill, you know, cause that was basically the first thing. Once you take it to a place like Nebraska, like it's completely like separated from its original intent and origin. And that doesn't make it less valid, but like. I would argue that's how Rodney Mullen got it. Cause he was just on flatland doing flat tricks. Right. Right. And so it like opens up a new thing, but it's also like, it's, you can't deny that it's separated from its original origin and that it has to like this thing finds a new origin. Like, and, and so I wonder if sign spinning is similar in that way, in that when we take it away from the waves, the street, the, the cars, when we take, when we take surfing away from the ocean and it becomes skateboarding, what, what does that really mean? What does that look like for sign spinning in particular? It looks like epigenetics where external influences are forcing the evolution of something. Um, in this case, uh, the lack of hills forced the evolution of skateboarding into flatland tricks. Um, man, the uh, I think science spinning could be early science spinning today is a is an evolution of pressures. I guess like people are just taking competing more seriously. Um, are they? I mean, at the rate that they're trying and the rate of innovation that's happening, I think that's the reason why we see so many backyard spinners instead of corner spinners. I mean, you know, like to be all the way fair pandemic, like uh, there, 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 there should be more backyard spinners right now. Like just, yeah. just to be fair to everybody. It's not just, <laughs> yeah, we had two years to get good. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But you know, I have such I have such a skewed perspective, you know, being responsible for the creation of so many tricks, like independently. And I can honestly say, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it came from collaboration and working with people and like, you know, observing things about their style and like, oh, so you do this wrong? Well, let me take that from you and do it right and call it a new trick. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, but then there's also, you know, just like just random stupid style discovery like you know one of the one of my uh one of my favorite activities at practice when i ran out of things to do was called a, a game called i'm just gonna do this where everybody stands in a circle and you completely blank out and you yell i'm just gonna do this or wait no you grab it from an unconventional uh, an unconventional position 
So you put both hands or one hand in a place that you've never held it before, then yell, I'm just going to do this and do whatever happens. And if you catch it, then other people have to try to recreate it. And <laughs> and that's that's the kind of, I mean, I used to play that game with myself. <laughs> Silently. I'm just going to do this. <laughs> yeah, see if you can do it twice. Yeah, and that's and and that's that's how that's how you claim nutrition for yourself. Is just I'm just going to do this. <laughs> that's an interesting approach to like what's the what's the best that could happen. You know what I mean? Um, I just I just got done listening to uh, a letter from Saul to another artist where um, yeah, he I read encouraged the, her Eva, to Eva Hesse. Yeah, he encouraged her to do it. something it's stupid. Great. Like, just make the dumbest thing you can do, too. Like, what's, who cares? Like, just stop yeah. thinking and just, just do. Um, yeah, man, that one, that one hit. Um, I wanted to tie that back to, to visual art, because I think there is something to be said about science spinning as a, as a, I guess, a tangible art form. Cause I know, um, all right, so. Visually speaking, I can appreciate this all day long, right? Like I can, I can hold this in my hand. It's mine to do as I wish and display where I want. Um, yeah. Movies are very much the same. A movie is oh shit. a movie is a piece of cinematic art that you have to watch from start to finish in order to appreciate the whole piece. Same thing with music. It's usually a track or an album that you have to listen to from start to finish to appreciate the piece in its entirety. Um, with our routines having a beginning and an end, um, I can't help but feel the same way where you have to observe somebody's performance or their trick from start to finish in order to appreciate the artful expression that they have just displayed. Um, that being said, you can buy a movie off the shelf for like 30 bucks, you know, 4k and Blu-ray included or whatever. Um, in some cases, some of our spinners have also sold their art for a couple thousand dollars. Uh, the last world champion receives $5,000 for a 45 second performance. So in some fashion, I mean, at least in the context of competition, they have sold a 45 second performance for $5,000. Um, if there's a way, I guess I just don't see the difference between that, a movie or a song. And that, and that's my argument for, for deeming this an art, despite the competition and despite the, the, you know, the underlying sport, sporty nature of the whole thing. Well, anybody that says it's not an art and is, that, is an asshole. <laughs> you can quote me on that. <laughs> because... Uh, <clears throat> Because once, like, because once anybody starts to deem themselves the art police, take a fucking walk. <laughs> Real shit, man. Like, you know, you could, you could, it's like, one of the best things is that it's really easy to say, this is art. You know, you can look at a fucking cupcake and be like, this is art. You can't look at a cupcake and say, this is not art. It's like, fuck, take a walk, dog. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, why? why what what in the world isn't what in the world isn't art as far like for my visual art that i've been doing i have taken a real interest in stains hmm. and i can show you watch this show oh i can change my background uh because i think i still have it your interest yeah. in stains um stains it's it reminds me of look at this shit this is exactly what i'm talking about when when i mentioned that uh ah oh shit man this is Dude, touching this, a concept i wanted to bring up this is uh garbage water from a dumpster damn like you can see like this little curve right here is where the wheel the caster wheel pivoted on itself to move back into the dumpster area wow and so like i've been looking at stains and like i you know because i've been i've been avoiding going back to painting because i 
you know, as, as any artist, and I can freely admit this, I worry that I'm not like particularly good at it. Right. You know, because, because can, like, it's a physical form, you know, like paint brushes and mixing paint and all that, like it's a physical thing and you can fuck it up, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, and, uh, but then I look at the stain and I'm like, these paint, these, the brushes of chaos are all around us. You know, like, yeah. why do I even need to paint? I could just take photos of people's stains, color them, and call it a painting. Like, <laughs> what's the difference? Yeah. What's the difference? The progress, right? Not not the progress, but like um, <clears throat> the fact that you're moving from one medium to another is one of the things that I wanted to talk about in terms of like, um, oh, shit, man like the the progress of an artist right it's it's they're fascinated by one thing they'll focus on it and then that might that focus might move them into something else in a similar way that a science spinner might get stuck doing the same routines but then being stuck there or, or finding uh i don't know man i i don't i don't have the words for it but there's 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 definitely something to be said about progress whether it's a science spinner or a painter or even a musician because you can hear the difference between somebody's first album and their last album and if you really pay attention you can figure out what elements have changed and unfortunately sometimes that's the reason why people don't like an artist anymore like a musical artist because he ah, doesn't sound the same his first album was better you know what i mean um of course that's subjective but nonetheless i think that's a great way that to document the progress of an artist where i don't it slip it slips my mind right now but there was one artist in particular that that stood out to me because he was painting he started off painting hyper realistic portraits and then towards the last part of his career he like he just painted a black square and it sold for like millions and that's just an example of how his attitude towards everything and not just his attitude, but I mean, it could have his inspirations, um, his interpretations. I, I got to throw in there that, um, that the art world and the finances associated with it are, uh, not, are not based on artistic merit or value. Oh no, yeah, no, not at all. It, I mean, so, well, in this case, it was subjective. Somebody actually appreciated that more than their hyper-realistic shit. I guess that's where it, it, the value in art is, how much is the next person willing to pay for it? Yeah, I, um, I uh, am on a, so for all of my music, I'm on a playlisting website mm -hmm. and sometimes I get reviews, you know, they, they'll, they'll, you know, most of the reviews are pretty good, so, but sometimes like I, I've come to really enjoy negative reviews because no matter how specific it is, it always comes down to, I don't understand this. <laughs> hmm. Because if you understood it, you, you wouldn't say any of this shit. So my, my joke explanation of this is music critics are like, this is a really great apple, but I wish it tasted like barbecue sauce. Keep it up. And you're like, you just like barbecue sauce, dog like yeah <laughs> like, like and there's nothing wrong with barbecue sauce i love barbecue sauce but i made an apple so like either like take your like people people should be forced to contextualize their opinions but they don't nah i, I, I mean because because if you actually had to contextualize your opinions you'd end up liking everything and people can't do that that's like, an interesting point i realized that as much as i have trouble seeing the artistic value in the island boys <laughs> i love them because that is some absurd stuff but they believe like they're there they're putting themselves out to do it yeah and that's hard like is it what i will listen to no but I like people love that whole like I might not agree with everything you say, but I will defend your right to say it. It's like, no, you won't. Shut the fuck up, dog. Shut the Yeah, we're not seeing that at all. Shut the fuck up. Like it's it's uh 
You know, when I, when I recognized, like I crossed the thing and it's, it's like, we all operate from the same creative energy. Everybody who does creative stuff is all using the exact same energy. It's a well, we all draw out of the same well. The difference is the vessel that is carried in us, you know, and our life experiences, our society, our opportunities. Uh, our beliefs, all of that thing is what you're actually seeing. You're not seeing the creativity. It's all the same resource. It's like, it's like a potato. How many different ways have you seen a potato or an egg? Like it's all the same thing. It's the same ingredients. And, And so when I recognize that my art is just a product of the same infinite creative substance run through my filter, and I actually believe that if I actually believe that, then I have to give that grace to literally every single other artist or someone who calls himself an artist on the planet, because some art is not meant to be understood. Some people are not meant to be understood. Sign spinning was forced to be understood because it's a business. But like, yo, what would sign spinning be if it was treated like a, if it was invented by a guy who really liked kites. You know? Yeah. No, what, what if, if Max wasn't... just had a, a huge kite fetish his whole life and <laughs> then got a job as a sign holder? What would that be? Like, yeah. you know, like, like where does, why does it all intersect? It doesn't. It doesn't have to. Like, people, people want answers. They want clarity. They, no, doc, give up. You're yeah. like, it, if the if the universe is truly absurd and there is no meaning, we all get to make up our own meaning. You have to control for the fact that you're definitely not going to understand a lot of other people's meanings. Yeah, that was super insightful. I, I never thought about what science spinning would be removed from the advertising aspect. Would it be comparable to like? Well, I mean, even then, that so doesn't make sense because rifle spinning isn't detached from. I mean, that was a rifle spinning was invented by bored people with guns. Yeah, but the point is, they had guns in the first place, so that yeah. was born out of a different necessity. <laughs> Similarly, you know, science spinning was born out of a different necessity. It was a necessity to advertise, and now here we are. I'm still not art. certain what ROTC and gun spinning does. Like, I, I'm still not quite sure what the purpose of that is from a military perspective, but <sighs> got to have um, something to do. I guess the same... I don't know. I don't see it any differently as like doing tricks with your phone. That's super dangerous. You can crack your screen. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it showcases yeah. your I dexterity. I, your I don't know. They make, they make a pretty, pretty big deal out of it. Yeah, because I mean, how well do you shoot it now? Good job, but shit, can you hit a target from from a distance? Yeah. Um, God, that would be such a great a great story about a guy who's like or like two friends one that's a really good shot but can't spin it for shit and one that's really good at spinning it or like twin brothers or something and they like switch places and they're in the middle of it. <laughs> i don't know yeah that's that's exactly the point so in terms of the art episode yeah it, it would totally be in orange county um god that is a terrible place to be right now really oh yeah well I, I I was just talking to Stephanie earlier about how I think this is what the world would have looked like if we didn't shut down, where the numbers are just all over the place. The economy's still going, but like, no, it's not. I mean, I I just it's a weird one. Not, uh, I, not sure what to believe. <laughs> mm. Five days? No. Oh yeah, Don't here we are, it. two years in. You know, uh, yeah, the more transmissible thing, uh, yeah, four hours is close contact, and we only need five days. No, I don't buy that. I don't buy that. What do you mean, five days? It's uh, the they shorten the quarantine period from 10 to five days. Oh, okay, yeah, that's batshit crazy because, like, for at least two of those five days, I, I was like, I mean, I, I wasn't like fucking wrecked or nothing but it's just like like 
it's no, not I, it's not convenient you know <laughs> like, it's not the end of the world but it's definitely not convenient like this is a super inconvenience it's like it's just unnecessary that's really what it feels like and that's where my annoyance comes from is that this this feeling is totally unnecessary and it didn't have to go like this but here we are and now uh yeah i don't i guess this is just life now um life has an interesting life has an interesting way of revealing itself in that in that our our th- things change and it deepens our understanding of them but it's actually still the same it's like do things change i don't know hmm. ha- ha- like what i mean <laughs> we see games but i think i think we've i think we've made gains in technology and in economics and in agriculture but not in philosophy i think that uh i mean i would love to go and ask people what what philosophy they subscribe to like what's what's your answer to life like what do you like what do you why are you doing anything why why do you go to work why do you get out of bed why do you uh keep your promises why do you do anything why like is it a moral thing is it a societal thing is it just easier to do whatever it is you're doing and i just don't think that people have subscribed to the idea that they are are literally um onto like uh like intrinsically required to choose a philosophy to live your life by or else you're probably going to end up somewhere near existential nihilism where nothing matters and people don't count. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's the extreme end of it. huh? I mean, I just think, I think there's a very natural uh, without, without a conscious declaration, I consider myself an absurdist. Uh, That, that is what makes sense to me. And it has, it gives me the resilience to continue in the face of cruelty and ignorance and brutality and all that. And I think that people, when faced with the same cruelty and indifference and all that, if they don't have some kind of philosophical like foundation to put that against, it will lead you to nihilism. It will like nothing matters. Like who cares? And that's just not <laughs> fundamentally uh, helpful to a society. Whether it's true could, or not, I can't debate. <laughs> I think you can end up with the same results, even if you choose to go on the other end of the spectrum and commit yourself entirely to a philosophy. Um, it, it can get to the point where it's not so much that people don't matter, but this philosophy is the only thing that matters effectively voiding people. Um, I'm only saying that because um, having that foundation is one of the reasons why, although I personally believe that in, in cases that I can cite religion does poison a lot of things. However, (laughs) if it, if it gives people a foundation or a reason to not be a dick or if it if it's a coping mechanism then and it keeps them from one of those two extremes then i i'm for it um but i just think that those philosophies aren't exclusive to religion and i think a lot of people are having a hard time uh grasping that where like thou shalt not kill is not exclusively owned by any one religion like you can just choose not to kill people because it's a it's a dick move or you can choose to keep pressing forward because I mean, maybe, maybe I just drive or draw my philosophy from a different place, but just, Oh, the- well, it, it's the, um, in absurdism, the, the right to kill is negated because it's because 
you have not been given a clear right to exist in the first place. So to revoke someone else's is uh, not, it's nonsense. Because like, neither one had just, the right to begin with. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just like not not a thing. Like, it's like, you're not from here either, guy. Like, Yeah. <laughs> Oh, hey, you know, now that you, all right. Um, I'm probably circling back a little bit on this one, but in, you were talking about uh, everybody's creativity comes from the same place. Um, what are your thoughts on, on free will? And, and this example, if I ask you to think of a memory, any memory of your choice, Right. If you have it, did you sincerely pick up all of your memories and then choose that one? Or did that one come to you? Because I asked. Um, and how would that affect the creation of art? Are you really the creator or are you like the receiver or the vessel in this case who ends up? just for myself personally and and to skip to answer the last part of your question um myself personally i consider myself a communicator uh a lot of this stuff that i do is my attempt at approximating things that i can see without my eyes like that i know exist but don't exist here and so it's my it's my attempt at it's like I am aware that we are we are in this dimension by chance. <laughs> and not to mention just in this bubble of a universe where all these laws took that same chance. Um, and so I took this philosophy class um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm a very participatory student, you know, I like to really, you know, if it says do two replies, I'll do five or whatever. Yeah, you know, dude, I, <laughs> some I like, of them are just I like juicy. In there. I like getting in there, you know, because yeah. I got time and I feel like I'm going to get my money's worth out of the education. Like I am, I'm really, I'm really oh, like trying, trying to get my money's it. worth. Shit. Yeah, dude. And uh, my teacher sent me a private DM email that had a link to an article. And it, all it said was, free will isn't real. Read this. And I was like, okay. I don't want to say I'm a subscriber to that idea, but well, it's, it's a hard one for me. I'm on, I'm on a knife's edge here. It's, you know, we're, we are a product of the chemical reactions in our brains you know our yep. our actions and our beliefs and our memories are all chemical reactions like snapping my fingers requires a set of like sodium ions or what the fuck ever i'm 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 not there <laughs> i'm only second year so I'll, I'll let you know once i get to that part <laughs> yeah the axons and the dendrites and uh, the, the action potential and all that right I, yeah, that's why we need electrolytes one, and shit <laughs> it's the 101 i'm not i'm not the, i'm not the 201 yet. yeah um but it makes sense it makes sense that like you're like if if your brain has to do certain things and isn't equipped to do certain things then why would you be expected to your brain is formed without your consent <laughs> yeah you're just kind of given a brain yeah. and a body if you're lucky, I guess. Well, and uh, so, I mean, is it free will or are we acting out our biological impulses? I have no problem seeing it as this is what my, I'm programmed to do. I don't have a problem with that. I think that people who argue that uh, haven't aligned themselves with a philosophy that allows them to contribute positively to society because once you like once you start 
participating in selfless acts and in like love and like, you know, helping others, you feel really good about not having free will. If you're fucking people over, you want to believe that it was a choice and that you're not actually programmed that way. <laughs> Let me take it one step further. You were given a brain or a body without your consent. The one thing that I find kind of disturbing along those lines is that you're also given sentience and self-awareness without your consent. It's almost as if our genes deemed it necessary for us to be this self-aware in order to survive, despite the fact that plenty of other evolutionary chains have showed us otherwise. We don't need to be this self-aware or this sentient to survive, yet somehow, some way, whatever pressures we'd faced, it, it made us this self-aware. Well, I mean, dude, look at us. We're fucking sperms with arms and legs. It, that's the weirdest. Well, not the weirdest, but the fact that those that we can say that, like we can acknowledge. I, I know you. I know you've seen the whole like comparison of a sperm cell and the spinal cord, like the yeah. skull and the spinal cord, bro. We just grew arms and legs. But everything else that comes with it, though, is what's. Like the fact that we can even hold the discussion uh, about our thoughts on art is, is really, it's, um, I, I just don't know what free will is at this point, because I don't know if the thoughts I have are, all right. So I read a book by Dawkins and he was talking about how your body, we are the vessels and the genes are the replicators. And the replicators are the ones who are really in charge because they will make the vessel do whatever is necessary for it to survive and propagate itself. So are all of our actions, like, are we speaking on behalf of our genes or did we effectively own our genes? Cause I know sometimes we're, we're overriding our commands every now and then, like whenever you choose to skip a meal, you're going against the commands of your genetics. See, I think that's a point in favor of free will because, yeah, we got the whole dopamine system to encourage having sex, but how does that explain meth addicts? It's the hijacking of the sub the substance hijacks that right. Entire... So, like, you know, obviously, like, there's got to be some kind of interpretive choice here. You can't be pro like, you know, you can have a predilection for addiction, but it's not like it's not like people are put on the planet to smoke meth like directly sure. like that that is like the the full purpose people mm. who use methamphetamine are people with like full lives and hopes and dreams and love and you know addiction's bad but it's not like that's a singular purpose even i mean even in the depths of addiction where it might appear that way it's not true mm. you know so like uh there's got to be some level of choice but then it's like this I mean, we, humans were created in a much simpler time where there wasn't much to choose from, you know? Ooh, damn. So everything that we're experiencing might just be a side effect of where we're at now. Yeah. Our, our, by, okay, I'm going to throw it out here. If you factor... If you, if you consider each human being as a unique artistic individual, which I do, mm -hmm. uh, with their own unique creative value, the output of that is plays against our, our basically replicates the feeling of free will because where you know 500 years ago how many songs how many songs even were there like it's like a it, it at a certain point it becomes a countable number i mean a thousand years ago 200 years ago i don't know what where it becomes like this exponential growth where it's like okay we can't count music anymore but it's like as the population increased the availability of creative works of art has simulated our uh, our 
perception of free will. The illusion of choice creates the perception of free will. And the more humans on the planet creating more things makes us easier to lose ourselves in the idea of choice. I feel it. I think Sam Harris has a similar sentiment where he's talking about uh, free will is it's an illusion. He goes into he goes into it uh, much deeper than, than I mean. I could. What would I'd you rather... even do with it? What would you even fucking do with it? Free will. It's like okay, well, I'm free to make the choices that my brain thinks are best. Guess what? You didn't program your brain. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. like, what do you what do you want? <laughs> what do you want? What you want is you want to be able to put all of your I- ideal beliefs and dreams and positivity and live laugh love all into a laptop plug it in your brain wipe your whole brain and then replace it with stuff that you chose that's what you want that would be free will guess what we don't work that way i didn't get to choose whether or not i went to sunday school and now i have a weird feeling about certain things (laughs) like i didn't you know like you don't we don't get uh we don't get to wipe the slate so like you know nietzsche talked about that shit uh and i wrote a song about it about um uh i wrote it so smart before uh the the modern system of morality is drawn from a, a it is it's the historical weight of opinion where thousand like hundreds of generations ago people made arbitrary decisions about certain things like i mean pink and blue is a great example like when did we make a decision as a fucking species that pink is for girls like come the fuck on y'all are gonna and but like you know an arbitrary decision like that pink is for girls which i don't believe at all by the way i love (laughs) yeah uh uh there's a lot it's of like arbitration. Those, those things get, it's like an arbitrary decision that leads to, fuck. I read this book. It, it was like, <laughs> it was like, it, it was <clears throat> a, an arbitrary decision that leads to a tradition that leads to a custom. And we're currently living in a society where you are rewarded based on how well you adhere to the customs of your specific culture. That's spot on. It's interesting how many other things are a result of arbitration, like just the, the words that we say, the, the particular noises that we assigned. To oh, certain... don't do this. <laughs> don't, don't do the, what do words even mean? How do you know what I mean when I say elephant asparagus bologna sandwich like how do you know that's nonsense it's a great example though of uh of how we're currently living in that arbitration like this is traditionally english that we're speaking um it's dude it's... i so so i recently took spanish one trying I, I'm I'm so sorry, California. I'm, I'm not there. <laughs> uh, but one of the most fascinating things to me, and obviously you understand this, um, is English is uh, adjective subject, and Spanish is subject adjective. Yeah. And I think that this is the most relevant in the phrase "disabled person," which in Spanish is "persona de capacidad," yeah. discapacidad. You're a person first. Oh, wow. And then your descriptions follow rather than you being your descriptions. Yeah. It's what English is the sentence structure. English grammar is what can this person do for me? Dude, that's all right. So that reminds me of another point someone else made where whenever you're speaking another language, often if you're not putting it through the filter of your native language and then doing the thing, if you're if you're, I don't want to say like 
really bilingual but if you're if you're bilingual to the core you can see how you you really think in an, like thinking in another language is a different way of thinking altogether and i think that's one of the what you just said is one of the best examples for it mm-hmm. you're thinking of the person before their characteristics or anything like that their adjectives so to say yeah so thinking I in mean, another language it, is powerful it's clear as day in that specific phrase like how little how english is engineered to exploit people wow i didn't uh, now whether that's on purpose or not is probably another topic uh i just yeah. wonder if maybe that's just another one of those points of arbitration where it's like well we could pick one or the other and uh all right i'll take it all the way back <laughs> Uh, divine right, monarchism, kingdoms. Uh, mm. I rule this land because God said so. Mm. It gives you the ultimate, uh, like as a king, you have the ultimate right to dismiss, murder, whatever, anybody, however. And so people begin to present themselves is as why you should. <laughs> Let me start with why you shouldn't kill me. It's because. I make a good ass bread. <laughs> like, all right, yeah. So what they do is more important than who they yeah, are. Because being a person doesn't matter. Yeah, it's divine right, dude. It's divine right. The whole thing, the whole thing, divine right. And then the people who set out, like you know, the American colonists were like, you know what? Don't tell anybody, but I'm gonna be king. And everyone has that same thought. And now we're all just an individualistic society. We're all kings of our own kingdom. And we want to know what other people can do for us. But guess what? Divine rights not real. <laughs> Doesn't that translate to like modern day capitalism? Like what can this absolutely what can this person do for me or what can I do for them? And then we have an exchange going on. No, I mean that's that's the you know, um settler settler colonialism is a direct I mean, the doctrine of discovery, it's divine right shit. God said, God said nobody would be here. So what's going on? Like, you got to leave. Like, <laughs> yeah, they said this house was going to be empty, bro. Yeah, dude. They got, a classy <laughs> name. They, got a, they got a classy name and everything, dude. People already live here. Well, that's inconvenient. Like, no, nah, dude, it's, it's settler colonialism. It's all, it's, it's all based on. The lady in the lake. It's like one fucking thing. People just like felt so put off by the fact that God didn't pick them to rule England. (laughs) Yeah, that's why, you know, whenever, whenever athletes or like musicians or actors, whenever they thank God for winning the Super Bowl or they thank God for their Grammy, I always feel like the, uh, the losing team could equally blame God. Like, man, it's all God's fault. I lost the Super Bowl. Or it's, ah, it's yeah. God's fault. I didn't get the Grammy. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, right. And then that's why people go start the XFL and shit. It's like, well, I guess if God's gonna make the Patriots win every year, I'm gonna I'm gonna make my own God yeah. and sports league to go with it. Like, you know, I it's all so linked. It's all so linked and where does it where does it bring sign spinning it's we've really monitored like it's the it's the shortest path between creative expression and monetization i'll tell I you was that just thinking that yeah it's the shortest absolutely path. there's there's nothing in between it there's nothing in between just like because <laughs> i mean like you somebody's <laughs> I, I don't know i don't know the one thing i i sincerely appreciate about her whole project here is the fact that like there are professionals in their respective fields who are like there's an artist who's calling this art there's a dancer who's calling this dance and i think it means a lot to me to have people outside of our field see us for what we see it as or to see our our craft for what we see it as and so um 
that's her whole focus with the uh with having it at the art gallery to show people that like yeah there's a there's a whole world of people who who look at this the same way and score score one for the uh infinite creative substance theory is that we're all drawing from the same well that's why they can recognize that there you yeah dude and that that goes to the bin analogy she was saying we can put us both in the same bin you can put dance and science spinning in the same bin labeled motion hey if you're good at music and cooking you don't you know what you know how those two things go together (laughs) music and cooking i'm assuming yeah this would uh this is a whole other conversation i have a whole thing i have a whole thing i imagine i expect nothing less (laughs) i'll I'll Uh, start by saying that vegetarian that that meat as a as a food group is vocals Oh, okay. Because, yeah, because every because other plate can be vegetarian, instrumental. Vegetarian cuisine, instrumental, totally doable. Every Still good music. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, you know, I was even... And I was, you can serve meat by itself. You ever had just a steak on a plate? Straight acapella. Straight acapella. Yeah, I, I, I was kind of... Maybe mine's a little more... Ab, or a little too... I don't know. I don't know if I'm abstract or not enough abstract. But I was thinking you can obviously make the same dishes with different tools it'd be like producing the same song with different instruments oh dude the the parallels are extremely real about how to prepare a plate about how to prepare a dish both of them are come are essentially you're composing something you're putting a bunch of pieces together big or small and sometimes the pieces aren't even like big ass notes. They're just like little sound effects. And that could be the seasoning salt. Yeah. Oh my God, man. Seasoning. It, seasoning is uh, the effect. Reverb delay. Delays. Yeah. Holy shit. That's crazy. Cayenne yes. pepper is your overdrive. Cooking what? is. <laughs> overdrive. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> shit, I mean, man. There's so many parallels to everything. It's, it's no wonder this podcast is happening. <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, NFTs. Yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to express one more thing on that because I think there is an opportunity here. Do you own F- NFTs? I'm making NFTs. Oh, oh, see. So I don't own one yet. That's not exclusive, but. Um, you're the sucky not the sucker yeah well i guess you could look at it that way i was really i just think it's all right i'm not looking at it as a cash grab by any means and i think that's where a lot of people are fucking up everybody's looking at it as like a sick ass another fucking wave another like get rich quick another amc pump you know what i mean but when you look at the the utility behind it right one example it could serve as a medium of ticket sales so if you only mint a thousand NFTs and each NFT is a representation of your ticket, that means only NFT holders would be able to attend this thing and you wouldn't be able to oversell the tickets either. You know, there's only a thousand and therefore there can only be a thousand participants. You can't clone them. You can't copy them. And it's, it seems to me as a really secure way to sell a ticket. The second reason, uh, let's say I sell you a car we can have the title be represented by an NFT or just NFT the title, right? And so when I sell you my car, I also transmit the NFT to you, which means you would be the exclusive title holder to that car or to the title that's associated with that car. And I think that's another means of, uh, I guess, it, I mean, it's called a smart contract, but it just seems like a really good way to to utilize NFTs outside of the cash grab. Because if my car is worth $6,000 and I'll just sell you my title for $6,000 and the car is yours with it, you know what I mean? Um, but from a more personal stance, uh, going back to a former world champion winning $5,000 for a 45 second performance, if I can mint one of my tricks or even one of my rounds, now I have a means of selling or or giving my my piece to somebody else. 
I got a bro- I got a bridge in Brooklyn that you should look at. <laughs> I- I'll sell you this bridge in Brooklyn. <laughs> it's it's a little different though, because um, this is those are just you can obviously take photographs or or screenshot whatever you want, but in this context, I don't see anybody in the NFT space. Uh, I mean, again, selling a piece of art is really cool. Like, um, for example, if I had an NFT associated with this one, this piece to say that I, I do in fact own this one, this one, like for, if it was a car, right? Like if there's one, if you want it, (laughs) I get that. But like, (laughs) like if you, if you have a Ferrari and there's only one of 300, you have a little badge on the car that says number 100 of 300. Right. And so the NFT would serve a similar purpose for that um i've seen artists do that with glass too where they'll put the qr code in a little marble or a milli on their glass and you can own the piece of glass and the associated nft with it so you scan the nft and it's a pic it's it's an image of so you can take it you you can take it home with you yeah so it's it's associated to something tangible it's like a certificate of authenticity in this case um but with I don't see anybody in the NFT space. I obviously they're selling art, right? People are selling art projects like one of ones with an associated NFT with it as a as their certificate of authenticity, but I don't see anybody in the NFT space doing that for art in motion like this, like for science spinning because I have seen somebody mint a music video. I've seen people mint songs where you're the exclusive owner of this track. I mean, obviously you can rip it, but you own the NFT associated with that. Like it'd be like um Oh uh, shit, that album that Wu Tang made. If you have a certificate of they made a, an album. Yeah, no, I know. Martin Screlly. Yeah, he bought it, but did yeah. they? What do you mean? I've never seen it. Well, that's 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 the exclusivity of it. Is is the fact that only he can play it, only he can listen to it, and if he chooses to s- distribute it afterwards, it's No, nah, the FBI got it. Really? Oh, that's yeah. right. As part of his shit, when he got sentenced, it was yeah. uh they they like took a bunch of his assets too for uh yeah because of cool. the amount of money that oh real fuck cool yeah cool I forgot guy. about that dude I was so focused on the fact like the one of one and like the certificate of authenticity with it just be really cool the yeah now the government owns it so yeah. so uh does the Wu Tang feel good about the FBI owning their only version of that album probably not. But then again, they did, they did it, they released it knowing anything could happen to it. You know, somebody could even distribute it, like I said before, distribute it themselves and make money off of it. That's on them now. But they've, by selling it, they've wiped their hands clean of it and it's not theirs anymore. You know what I mean? So in some regards, it'd be no different than like if Escobar owned one of your paintings. You know what I mean? Kind of like. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. It's kind of out of your hands now at that point. It's, it's his to do what he wants. Kind of like. A, I don't know. I don't. I as an artist, I'm not going for it. As a philosopher, I think it is a really interesting way to try to prove you exist. Mm. I was even well, thinking. Well, of course I'm real. I own this piece of art. Yeah. <laughs> but it also how could i how could i how could i not exist if i don't own this piece of art see it's on the blockchain this means i'm real it's immutable right but But, you know they say that but the sun might you know uh, yeah yeah uh, carrington events really happen yeah they do yeah they do so it's kind of like i don't know it's there's a lot of it I've been a digital pirate my entire life. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, and so for me, like as an artist, I cannot get behind the idea of manufactured exclusivity. I also believe that it, as an artist, if you create something that you want to share with the world, making it exclusive is the last thing you should do. So if you're creating mm-hmm. work that you don't want people to see, then okay sure but my goal is as an artist is to create things that resonate with myself and hopefully other people 
And the only way I'll find out if they resonate with other people is if I make them available. And mm. I mean, it's hard to say. Like, if I were a famous artist and people had, and there was a demand for NFTs from me, I, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't say. Mm. But where I'm at right now, it's like, it seems very counterintuitive to deliberately commodify my own creative energy. It, seem, it seems like I'm setting myself up for capitalism. That's what it feels like. Mm. It, it feels like I'm, I'm like taking away the creative thing and replacing it with market ready specifics. And I know that that's like, that's an exaggeration, but that's how it feels. No, you're not wrong. Cause um, going back to my car analogy, if you're really trying to drive up your profits and your bottom line, releasing only 100 of these cars is shooting yourself in the foot when Toyota's selling like a million. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, <laughs> I, and I mean, you know, the, the environmental cost of it alone, like if there's even potential for it to contribute to global warming, I can't, I can't get on it. I suppose this is where the, the, the project takes on a couple other dimensions that should help negate these negative things. Um, obviously, the first one being it's it's outside of a cash grab. But the second part is uh, the the uh, the novelty of it. Um, in regards to sign spinning specifically, spinners have always been talking about making their own trading cards with their like Pokemon cards with their, with like two of their tricks on it. Right. Yeah. I feel that minting an NFT is a way to accomplish that. It, and, but instead of having their trick written, written in text format, it would actually be them doing their trick. And if somebody felt so compelled to want to pay for this person's art then they don't necessarily have to buy a shift to get it because as of right now if you want sign spinning art the only way to get it is to if you want to buy it is to buy a sign spinner and put them out front you know what i mean i mean granted you can go on the arrow army page or on youtube and try to find a performance that you like um but i just think this is a novel way for spinners to get what they want in terms of the trading card thing and then put the power of selling it in the hands of the spinner. Like, yeah, this is me and this is my trick. This is my, this is my piece. Um, I just want to own it just to own it. Like just for the sake of me having, having it. Like, I, I just think it's, again, it goes back to the trading card thing. Um, and a lot of people collect trading cards and that's a massive market. Um, but I think this is just a, it's a unique thing to introduce to the NFT space. And if, if there's clearly artists out there who, or at least from what I'm now seeing, there are other people out there who are looking at our craft as art worth owning. Um, so as we mentioned before, if you feel emotionally compelled by a painting that brings you to tears, then it's worth buying. Same thing with a song. Like if, if it's, if, if it brings, if it's emotionally compelling, it's, it's worth buying the album. Right. And same thing with a car. Uh, if I find an emotional connection to it, I'm more likely to buy it. Um, there it is. That's my thing about it. The emotional connection. No, it's that it separates the art from the artist. You're not, when you buy a painting or buy a CD, mm -hmm. it's been commonly understood that you are supporting the artist and saying, I like what you're doing. I'd like you to continue doing it. Yes. But th this is a transition to something which I consider darker, which is I want to own what you do. Um, it's not... I mean, because because what ha like I, I i think we're still very early in the nft thing i think Agreed. we're going to see some tragic ass shit i think we're going to see oh, some we're already people, seeing some tragic shit oh my god i think we're going to see people who are prevented from creating their own type of artwork because someone else owns it 
because once you combine an NFT and a copyright, who fucking knows? Yeah, that one, that's definitely an unregulated, sticky, messy area. However, when when you mentioned supporting the artist, I think that's why I, I felt it was a powerful move for spinners to be able to have their NFT and then they would be the ones receiving payment for the trick that they did. Um, mm-hmm. So in that regard, it would be like supporting the artist because the money that you would otherwise be donating for that piece is going to the creator, which was the spinner. If I do mint Kadeem's 45 second round and somebody else feels like, yo, I, that looks, that looks tight. I want that. They would have to present Kadeem a value that is, that would separate his emotional connection from that NFT where he wants the money more than he wants the emotional connection to his to his work. Well, what if there's two camera angles? Then they wouldn't have that camera angle. They would have the one that that it's, it, was it's minted. Just, it's like, I don't know, man. It's, it's too... It's like standing on a beach of shiny rocks and saying, I own this shiny rock. Like, it's... I just, I don't... I think that's a little I out might, of context. I, I might have I might have to buy an NFT to see how little it feels like something. Cause you know, like I, I interact with artists a lot on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And I whenever I see something that anybody that prices anything under five dollars, I'm buying it. Because I know what it's like to not uh to not feel strongly enough to command a, a ticket price. And it's just like, oh, my art's whatever, so I'm going to charge nothing for it. And so I, I want to support that in a, in a direct way. And I don't know, man. It just seems, it's like, would you feel the same way if Visa, like if, if like Visa announced like, a, oh, you can, you could sell art through this Visa debit card program and we'll own the we'll maintain it and you get a debit card with sixty dollars like would and i know nft like i i am not an expert on crypto or nfts at all i don't i i tangentially understand it uh i know that it looks to me like a lot of opportunities for hustling uh yeah to take money off the books, which, you know, as, as a former criminal, like I, I admire, but yeah, as easy current, laundering <laughs> as a, as a current upstanding citizen, um, I don't, I, I just, it's just like, what happens? What, ha- like, I just don't see in the future, like, the the promises made by the NFT community are impossible. Like, oh, all these people are going to benefit. I the rug pull don't. ones for sure. Yeah, I, I can agree with you on that, dude. And I mean, it's just it just seems like a honeypot to me. It seems like, and I mean, by the way, you're spending like it's the fact that it's a fluctuating currency. And of course, I understand all currencies fluctuate, but it's like yeah there's there anybody sophisticated enough like who's got a good handle in wall street bets and who's got a good handle on fucking in in you know if if they're like notorious but also like you know they have three different personalities one on reddit one there one there you can do some massive market manipulation with just one person and so like the nft Mm -hmm. game seems like it's an opportunity for each person each hustler to step up and play their game for the day. Some people make money. The person doing all the, all the gaffling is definitely going to make money. And the people who like put their art, their heart, their like creative vision. It's, it's, I think it's, it, it depends on how much you care about what you make. I think this is comparable to the internet. Because as you mentioned, there are a lot of sinister actors out there, but there's also a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for good here. Um, 
the internet is uh, probably my favorite example, just because the internet can be used for things like human trafficking, but it could also be used for things like, um, trapping human trafficking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To summarize it. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> the NFT space is very much the same because with no regulation and in the infancy of its development, it's kind of, a uh, it's the wild west of, of our day right now. Uh, a lot of bad things can happen, but a lot of good things can happen. It's a road that hasn't been traveled enough. Um, I don't think it's all bad. There's a lot of um, no, no. I don't think like it's prescriptions. All bad. For example, if you had prescriptions on a blockchain, nobody could falsify a prescription anymore, right? I, I, dude, I think I think the idea of blockchain and cryptocurrency is is excellent. I think I think decentralizing currency across countries and like just throughout the world is a is a great idea because countries are made up and borders aren't real mm -hmm. so we may as well all use the same money you idiots <laughs> but... oh that's where it, all right you just made it click again um there were like three fundamental things that make for good money and one of them is stability and the fact that crypto doesn't have any of that uh, that's one of the things that turns me off as as a as a medium of currency right as a medium of money however as a medium of exchange I think that's that's something worth exploring. Yeah, but that's such a weird thing because it's like, you know, okay, so I know that I need to buy uh, two pallets of shingles for my house, right? Mm -hmm. And I know I'm going to use Ethereum coin, right? I could wait until the value is, it doesn't have to happen anytime. Sometime in the next year, I got to buy these shingles. I could wait until the cost, till the price is up so that I can spend less coins to get the shingles. But that leaves the shingle seller, like they're just gonna have to take whatever I choose to buy. Like it's like, or they could say, no, like we're not selling it under 0 0.2 or whatever, you know, it's like, and then we all just come back to like, if, if crypto was audit like today, tomorrow morning, cash wasn't real. It was all replaced in our bank accounts and wallets with cryptocurrency. We would, our buying habits would be very different. I would like wait, we would all wait to go to the grocery store until it's like, it's like, it's like how people act with gas prices now. It's like, oh, well, I'll, I'll wait to fill up because it's high today. It's like, it just makes it so, it's like office space. It's like that program where you can siphon off the fraction of a penny every day. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, man. I, it's, it's not that I have a choice. It's just like, I know this shit is jacked up. And like, as someone who personally believes in like positively contributing to society in exchange for something I can use to get the resources I can need, you know, like, should that change every day like if i work for 15 years every day and i store that money should that change a year later because it already does though and dude never in our favor the way <laughs> in our the problem with our current economy the way it works is it forces spending as of right now because thanks to inflation even before hyperinflation, but just thanks to inflation in general, we are forced to spend money today because it won't buy us as much stuff tomorrow. So that's already that 500 grand you put away for retirement is already worth less when you retire. So we already are facing a problem with, uh, you know, the stability of money and, and how it holds its value. So unless crypto can figure out a way to stabilize that, I don't see that taking over our current system either. If anything, would, would stabilization be better? Would it be better if it were stable? Like, isn't that the thermodynamics of the world where it just keeps things moving because it's always fucked? <laughs> yeah, I guess entropy kicks in at some point, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Anything that is ordered will eventually become disorder. 
That's an interesting yeah, point. Well, that's uh, that's my two cents on NFTs. I just thought it was a great way for to put the power back in spinners and let them own their craft. Like let Kadeem own his Jamaican me crazy. And if he feels Doug, if you want to do that, just turn sign spinning into Uber and let them fucking take the cost. See oh that? yeah, okay. If you want sign spinners to own their their talent, that's owning their work. You know what I mean? That's not really Dude, owning their their craft. Because at that point, you're 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 going into the business side again. You okay. Know what I mean? Now now here's my big fucking question: What's on the sign? Shit. Copyright law is an extension of divine right. The lady in the lake said that I own this. Fuck you. Pay me. <laughs> I gotta look this up. <laughs> um, it's it's an extension of divine right, dude. It's like you know, I I've been putting my I've been putting my art on Instagram and Facebook and all that for a long time, and I've already come to terms with the fact that at some point I'm gonna find a dummy account on Instagram with all my shit, and yeah. It's going to make me mad, but I'm also prepared for that because that is the nature of the internet. And it raises the question, do I own my art? Do I own this song? If you really believe, like I do, that my art comes from a place beyond my existence and that I'm communicating it, oh, I, shit. I don't own it. I get it. I the get artists, it now. The artists don't own their art. We don't own anything. We're <laughs> barely real. <laughs> wow. We're just Oh my god, man. It's it, it's similar to when Tesla said I, I just discovered something that was already there. Yeah. Dude, that's heavy as shit, man. Like, do I owe the trash man money for this? Yeah. This reminds me. This reminds me. And, I, it, you know, just because it was in New York, there was a guy who, uh, it was like 10 years ago, he got arrested uh, because he was harassing tourists in Times Square. And, you, you know, we have this at Hollywood Boulevard where it's like, hey, you like hip hop or whatever? And then you're like, yeah, the and they ask you your name. So this, this was this guy's whole hustle. He asks his name. You say, oh, my name's Justin. They say, to Justin. And write it in Sharpie on the CD. And then you're like, and he's like, 10 bucks. And you're like, I don't want that. He's like, well, what the fuck do you want me to do with it? It's 10 bucks. Like, I, I wrote your name on it. I can't just, I can't just walk around while looking for Justin. So, like, you got to buy this, right? Funniest thing about this, the CDs were blank. Wow. <laughs> what it, wasn't, a it wasn't even a mixtape. It was blank CDs. Blank CDs straight off the straight off the tower. <laughs> yeah. Just, you just write someone's name on something. See, this is the kind of like grift that like I'm worried that NFTs are actually going to reveal themselves to be. It's like I wrote your name on it. Where's the money? <laughs> A lot of them are like that, though. Like a lot of a so, lot of NFT projects are doing that, just that, where they're promising all kinds of like, not just monetary gains, but like, like access to exclusive things. Okay, for, here's here's one of my favorite, one of my favorite things behind NFTs. Right, whenever you're, let's say you're a, of of shit, dude, like a Capital One card holder, or a, or like an a. I don't know. There's a variety of different credit cards that offer you different perks. Um, like if you use my card, you Nothing get frequent flyer real. miles. Nothing right? is real. Credit cards aren't real. Flight airplanes aren't real. <laughs> but it, it goes. It, it kind of that's the utility that I, I I enjoy about it is is if you hold one of these NFTs, you're given exclusive access to certain. Uh, certain markets or certain events, right? Like certain pop-up shops or 
it's just an example. I mean, it can go further because, than that. Because we have listed you as a debt, uh, debt asset on our ledger, you can come see the Counting Crows play a show. As, but that's because Visa's, we, that's because Visa's we interpretation. Because you sold your debt to a foreign country for $2 million, come and see Sarah McLachlan play the saddest song you've ever heard. That's Visa, though. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what these fucking centralized institutions do. Uh in terms Dude. of decentralization, nobody's in debt. It's not I'm in gonna, debt. I'm gonna say this. I'm disappointed that no one has made Fight Club a reality. <laughs> I don't know, man. I oh fuck, you know. Oh god damn it. That's gonna be a messy conversation too, because like the first yeah. rule, right? How do we know? How do we know? How do we know that Masvidal and, and Kimbo Slice weren't part of that exact thing? Well, they didn't blow up all the credit card companies, so what's the point? Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, you know, for the, for the sake of me talking to my laptop, I don't advocate <laughs> acts of terrorism. These are all speculative thoughts that I yeah. don't encourage anyone to follow out. No wink. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that you, funny that you mentioned talking to laptops. Shit, man. Um. Crypto bros are watching us. <laughs> They're turning us into NFTs. All right, all of a sudden you see this happen. Like, hey, bro, that wasn't me that turned. <laughs> it's, um, like, it's like, dude, I don't know, man. It's so fucking like <sighs> we're crossing an event horizon of like <sighs> one day in the near future. Someone's going to die and they're going to have their consciousness in a thing. And someone's going to type into a computer and be like, what day were you married? And it's going to be like, oh, April 13th, 1973. And you're going to be like, fuck. You know what's terrifying about that idea about uploading your consciousness and everything? I got so. my grandpa's consciousness in NFT for his birthday. <laughs> the- <laughs> it's of an ape smoking a blunt. He loves it. <laughs> that's the crazy shit was when people start saying shit like that like oh no i'm only appreciating it for the art and it's kind of like no you're not you that know. one's weird but i mean going again back to the utility part of it by being part of the by owning this you're a member of of something that provides you with benefits optimistically in in real nft projects that's what happens in the rug pull ones that's just an empty promise here's what nfts are like to me and i just made this up so it might not be an accurate comparison hoverboards it's like but if hoverboards could range between fifty dollars and a million dollars and you don't know it's like you're barely going faster than walking and there are other better ways to go about it but you're the only asshole in north hollywood with a <laughs> <laughs> so good for you until christmas and then every child is going to run your shit over and you're going to call that annoying even though it was you, it was you. You were the ones that brought hoverboards to North yeah. Hollywood. I think this is just a. This is another. Yeah, it's it's internet. just like, I don't. I don't see. I don't want to reward selfish people. I like if if somebody wanted to buy a piece of my art and say, you know, I mean, of course, I'm also pretty pragmatic. So it's like if you want to keep it in your house, nobody sees it. Like, that's weird, but OK. Um, but it's like if someone comes up to me and, and like looks at a piece of art that I did on a wall and is all like, I love this. I want to make sure no one ever sees it again. And you're like. Mm what yeah from an I'll art give perspective ten thousand dollars to never show this to anyone ever again it's like but look at it this way what if what if you do that but without the the i'm the only one that could see this vibe right without that part if everybody let's assume you did launch nfts right like you got like 150 of them if you decide to host a gallery later on down the road like in in person 
then those 150 NFTs would serve as their means of access. Instead of that being like, well, I'm the only one that can view this. It's, it's not about I'm the only one that can view this. It's about I have proof that I have supported this artist. And now this serves as my means of entry. I, I have real, for myself personally, I have very strange, I have a very uh, disconnected sense of ownership to my art and that I'm proud that I made it, but I'm also aware that um, given enough time, somebody else probably would. And I don't know. I, it, it's, it's not like, when you consider that the the probability of our own existence is so so infinitesimally small that we are in this place right now having this conversation that you know it's super small it's small to the point that i think that it could happen twice <laughs> given all right you should um given enough time it's perfectly possible just because something is implausible doesn't mean it's impossible. For example, under no circumstance, as of well, right now, I can walk into my front door or fuck the door of this wall. I can walk into this wall for all of eternity, right? And for the most part, from our point of view, it, it's a wall that I'm just going to keep hitting my head against. However, <laughs> although it seems impossible, that I could pass through this wall like a superhero, uh, it's still a non-zero number. And we know this because quantum tunneling is one of the reasons why we see sunlight. Um, of course, I'm scaling this up by a, a yeah. huge factor. But the point is, the only reason why quantum tunneling happens is because it's an improbable event that happens over a long enough period of time to where it, it finally does happen. And so with this whole wall analogy, if you give it enough time, I will, in fact, teleport through that wall <laughs> in the same way that this event could happen twice. If you give it enough time, it, I, it'll happen. It's just, so what do you, like, I don't know. NFTs, so it is, a fund fundamental belief of mine that the only universal human desire is to confirm that you exist. Living is not a universal human desire. People kill themselves all the time. So right. that's not so. But in the instance of suicide, by killing yourself, you do prove that you existed because now you don't. Oh, yeah, that's an experiment to confirm your existence, too. Yeah. And so I think a lot of things that people do are to confirm their own existence. Are to it by using the rules of this reality that we have presented, you know, like if you eat something, it turns into poop, <laughs> you know. What would you do if one day you ate a full meal and it didn't? It was just shoot up food. And it did that every day for the rest of your life. Would you like, what would you do if every time, like, you know, like what if, what if you felt like, like what if, what if somebody like one time, one time in your life reached through you? Like, and put their arm directly through your chest as though nothing was there. You spend the rest of your time, you spend the rest of your life wondering about that happening. And I think we'd still do. I think we'd do that anyway. I think we tr we're all just trying to find out whether or not we're real. Because if we are real, things are important. If we're not real, things aren't important. And currently, we live somewhere in between the two. And so I think I think the NFT thing, I think the metaverse thing, I think 
it's an early misguided attempt to verify existence beyond our physical reality. It's like, I have to be real because I own this, you know? Hmm. And like, how are we, how are we sure that this isn't all one? How, how are we sure that you're not a hallucination or that I'm not a hallucination or like, how is any of this really independently confirmed? Uh, I don't know. At I, my core, I often ask that. So, you know, all the capitalism and exploitation and devaluation of creativity and all that aside, like, I just wonder what it feels like to buy an NFT. Because I suspect it's not as rewarding as people claim it is. Because, I, and I mean, as a comparison, if you go to an art gallery, and you see a painting, and you buy it, and you take it home, you're real. You saw something, you paid money, and you moved it from one place to another. Right. And NFT doesn't go anywhere. Like, you, you, you ever seen a link generator? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like, like what? Like, it's like owning Google search results. Or That's like, almost like, what it is. Yeah. I, You're the first mean, person to bring that up, too, by the way, which tells me that you know more about this than some of the other people I've been talking to. Jimi Hendrix said it best. Castles made of sand melt into the sea. Eventually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wanted to elaborate on one of your points there. Um, oh, okay. So there's an entire community of people who were making these types of purchases before NFTs were readily available in the, in the form that we see them now. People have been purchasing in-game skins, in-game weaponry, in-game yes, everything. This, I, I was talking with my friend Young, Black by Young, you know. Um, that's what it is. Microtransactions broke people's brains. <laughs> yeah. No, so, I'm serious. I'm so serious, dude. Like the... It, just the broken been, part. <laughs> we're spending real money on not real things it might be real though because i i i would pay a digital artist to design my logo or design um a type of motion an animation of some kind and that's not something i can physically hold outside of a flash drive either you know what i mean but here, here's here's the thing though and i i i understand if you're talking about an artist doing a commission, you're paying them for their labor, not for their art. Oh, shit. Another breakdown. And, you know, I am a digital artist. I release, I'm actually releasing every single piece of art I've ever made for free because I don't think it's real. <laughs> wow. And that's, okay. that's how, like, you know, that's, that's me putting my money down is I'm literally about like in, in 2022, I'm trying to put out 365 pieces of art one a day. And I'm, I'm making them available on the internet for free. Now, if I take one of those things and I make it a pillowcase, this is a real thing. Like the boxing this is gloves. A thing. Yeah, the boxing gloves or uh, shit. I have art all over the fucking place. I thought it'd be cool um, to commission a skateboard, to be honest. Like this deck. is a thing. This is a physical thing. Yeah. That's worth real money. This picture, it's cool. I love it. It's one of my favorite things I've ever done. Not worth money. But it's not a thing. It's a, I, I it's think an, I get what you're saying. It's an abstraction. It's a representation of a concept. Concepts don't yeah. cost money. Yeah. Now, taking what can you, you imagine just said, if somebody can you imagine if somebody was all like, "Pay me twenty dollars to understand how fucking the mind body problem works," you'd be like, "Okay, what is this college?" But um, <laughs> but it's a concept. You can't own a concept, and you can't sell a concept. 
I can sell pillowcases. I can sell canvases. I can sell prints. You can't sell a concept. It's like this, that dude that sold the Brooklyn Bridge a bunch of times. He didn't own the bridge. Yeah. That's, uh, that goes back to, um, I wanted to mention this at another time in our conversation because it, it was relevant, but now it's relevant here too. Um, ideas, they, we can all agree that these are, they are real. Ideas are real. We, we do get biochemical reactions. Yes. Yeah. We get strokes of inspiration that we can articulate and, and convey to somebody else. It's a thing, right? Oh, here's an example. A religion is a thing that isn't under, I mean, outside of Bibles and establishments and architecture and shit. It's a, it's an idea. These ideas, the things that get, oh man, am I going, am I going on a little bit here? The, I would the term, say, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, no, go ahead. The term meme. Do you know the origins of that? I know it was coined by Richard Dawkins. I know that it was <laughs> used to um, express complex ideas in simple formats. I don't know anything beyond that. It's essentially uh, a non-physical gene that gets passed on. And since it's non-physical and it's kind of more of a mental thing, it's how we put the M on it instead of the G. So it's an idea. It exists, but you can't hold it. It's something that's not tangible. Um, we exchange ideas all the time for free through discussion or whatever the case is, writing, and it's free. So I, yeah, so I, I, that being said, I'm, I'm now comfortable in saying, I understand what you mean. And it's not real. (laughs) And and, and then at the scope that you're using it too, I, I didn't know that that was like big picture for you. Yeah. Yeah, I've been a pirate my whole life. Nothing, nothing's ever stopped me from getting a, a piece of digital information because it's not real. I would have to steal a CD. Yeah. Like that's stealing. Much like stealing a painting. You have to go into somebody's house to get that shit. Yeah, you got to get through the laser system and everything. There's you a know? physical that's, fence. There's a real barrier there. It's a thing. And, it, and we got to think about what money is. Money is a representation of a contribution to society. Money should be used as a badge that says, I did my thing for everybody. Now, can I have some fucking tacos? And they're like, great. What'd you do? It's like, oh, I swept up the hospital. It's like, you're fucking great. Here's some tacos, right? It should be that. Money doesn't mean shit anymore because of upper management and fucking siphoning profits off. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Nobody has a trillion dollars. Elon Musk doesn't have a vault a scrooge mcduck vault it's not real so all his not real money can buy not real shit and doesn't mean anything to me yeah and in terms of money it really is a it really is just a number now you're you're i i put a hundred dollars in dogecoin and now it's worth two thousand that doesn't fucking make sense nothing changed Nothing fundamentally made it work better. I guess they did start taking it at Oakland Athletics game. So, but uh, <laughs> it's it's like digital art and digitized art isn't real. It's yeah. like it's like saying it's like saying uh, the monsters in movies are real. They're not. You only. It's a two dimensional representation of a of an idea of a concept, and you know, no matter how believable it is, it can't come into the real world. Yeah, it's not there. So, the real value, in this case, would probably be in live performances. So yeah, I mean, well, and and okay, I'm gonna throw this out here. This is a fucking i think the only people who should be 
filthy rich. Like, I think the wealthiest people in the world should be artists and athletes. But athletes are kind of a physical art anyway. So, but the fact that people who control computers and computers control money, those are the people that have the most money. Uh, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like, yo, like, okay, Beyonce or any of these like multi million dollar performers, every single one of those people shows up. And I don't think any one of those people would say that a hundred, like they spent one hundred and eighty dollars. I don't think any of those people would ever say I didn't get my money's worth. You know, it's about conveying an experience. It's about you know, transferring an idea, a set of ideas, a set of emotions, and it's it's real. It happens there. It happens there in the space in the Staples Center. You show up, you leave different. I I went to Kanye West Sunday service. I left different. Bro, I've been wanting to go to one of those. But then again, I don't know if it's a cash grab because, you know, religion is a tax write-off or tax exempt. So, Dude, uh, no, don't don't worry about that. Those are, that is like, that is the best, largest choir I've ever seen. And if, if for no other reason you need to hear 150 people sing really, really, really well, like that's, that's why to go. Don't, don't worry about whether or not, how often they say Jesus. Dude, they is literally just fucking striking. When you hear that choir open up all the way, it will, it'll, and it, and it really shows you, like, you will think differently about the power of voice after you hear yeah. that. Yeah. No, I, I've, I expected that from Kanye, to be honest. Uh, I thought uh, it'd be a hell of an experience. I, I, and there you go. Why does Kanye get credit for those mm. people? He sits down for most of it. Honestly, he said he, he only I would say that Kanye had a micro was was actively participating about half of the time. Hmm. I was just taking this uh, back to the experience portion, because you're not what do you get the same feeling when you buy an NFT? I just don't know what the, I, don't, I don't know what's there. I don't know what you do with that after. Yeah, because like, you know, you get you buy a painting like there are things you do when you buy a painting, you like nail a hole in the wall and you get to look at it and like so it's basically like made up art for made up money you know money as a currency like in a real world like in a real fair society where it's like you contributed here's your here's your resource tokens and i know that sounds like hella dystopian but that's what we <laughs> should be doing that's what we should be doing is like you know and it and it, it, Everything should cost what it costs. And we should all be able to support each other by doing the things that we love. Like, it's not that fucking hard. And like, if you don't know, and my answer to anybody who doesn't know what they love doing, school's free, bitch. <laughs> there's, a, there's a real case study for that where, uh, ah, shit, people, it has to do with people working for money and then people just, working for their passion projects and i think the study concluded along the lines of i mean it was it was pretty much people do better and work better when they're just doing something that they want to do rather than something that they have to do Dude, to get something you, in exchange there is there is no study that needs to prove that capitalism is fucking evil and that, like, dude, there's no, there's no reason. Like, can you imagine what it would be like if a company was actually like the worth of the company was just a sum of all of their employees' net worth? <laughs> this, this is, this is. Uh... Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Nah. This is why I like, all right, so I know this is not related in any way, shape, or form to, to our planning, but this, this is a topic that's always, always got me, I guess for lack of a better phrase, it keeps me up at night. Being born into capitalism, this is the only ideology I know. <clears throat> Who am I 
to make the judgment on whether or not this is the right ideology. I know there's a lot of people out there that feel a sense of nostalgia for the communist ideology. And I'm not sure if that's really better or worse, because the fact that everybody gets a piece sounds like a, a solution to the homeless problem. But being limited to what I'm given also sounds like a problem, like being unable to pursue uh, or do something that I want to do when I want to do, rather than I have to do this because I'm obligated by my community. Like I have to, I have to do this in order to contribute to my, but then again, well, what like, do you want to do? Uh, you know, like <clears throat> there's a lot. <laughs> I mean, look, like the thing is, and, and let's, let's also, let's also, uh, if we're, if we're going to do the capitalism thing, let's look at, uh, the stigma surrounding unskilled labor, uh, janitors, yo dog, like if it, if, if it means like, like we should all be janitors, we should all, like, we should all be custodians of our environment. We should all like the fact that we're we've compartmentalized ourselves into doing one thing rather than functioning as a community unit it seems so far away because it's like what if i'm the only one what if i'm the only one doing the thing and yes. true if you're the only one who's trying to help it's going to be a lot of work but the thing is that everyone's like stuck in this like you go first and a lot of people never, you know, jump in the pool too. So it's like, I don't know, man. I think, and, and here we go, free will, biochemical reactions. Like, what's empathy? How, if free will isn't real, then what's empathy? Why do I care so much? Yeah. Why do I have to care? Why do, the, why do the richest people in the world not seem to have to care? They don't seem like they care at all yeah if empathy wasn't real then movies wouldn't work dude how you know? <laughs> how like and that makes me wonder like what's jeff bezos's favorite movie like do you understand art and emotion because i don't know how long you could live on this planet before you're like man this is bad we should do something yeah except uh, he's the guy with the resources I think it goes back to the compartmentalization and society that, that you brought up earlier um, with the whole janitorial thing. I think it's a construct of our society that says I'm above that. You know what I mean? There's so many people that have that sentiment. And I think that's a, uh, yeah, it, that's one of the it, reasons there. Dude. And, and check this out. Um, Industrial revolution. I mean, of course, it probably goes back to something like that. The Industrial Revolution created the separation of blue collar and white collar. You know, and I, I heard a very interesting thing, which was uh, blue, blue collar people shower at the end of the day and white collar people shower in the morning. Wow. That's not a far reach from the truth either. That's pretty spot and, on and it's like middle management laid laid the groundwork because i mean like here's the here's the thing though is running a factory like you're running a textile mill in new york in 1875 right, right. somebody's got to order the parts somebody's got to like be in the thing like sending letters or what the fuck ever so you can get your reams of fucking sheep skin so you can make shoes but somebody's got to do that and then somebody's got to actually be down there making the fucking shoes. And at some point, they decided that the person making the phone calls is more important. Damn. Somehow, some way that was. I, I get what you're saying. It's almost like a, that's how we came to look at everybody working under that as unskilled labor. Yeah. Versus and all you being have being able to it, pick up a phone is skilled. Like, <laughs> Right. No. And that's the thing is it's like. But you can't, like, you tell that guy who's been making phone calls for 10 years, he's got a nice house, he calls these people unskilled, you can't go on the fucking floor and make a shoe. 
you get fucking killed. People were dying in these fucking factories. You're going to call these people unskilled? They still, yeah. to this day, die in factories and on docks and on train yards and all that shit. And on the fucking power lines and all these fucking things. Unskilled labor? Dude, fuck off. Not to, I'm not endorsing the other side of the coin here, but um, to make the counterpoint, what if this whole this whole shoemaking thing was your idea and you've scaled your business up to the point where one person can't do it alone and you need a team to, to get this done considering that those shoemakers are focusing on one solitary task while you're overseeing that they're doing their part and other branches are doing their parts as well. Um, doesn't it make sense for your pay rate to go up proportionally? <sighs> Going back to the janitor thing. Oh, oh, I know the answer to this. <laughs> Hourly wage is that. Say that is, again? Is that, is that it, should, it, it should come like... You know, you should get a calculated percentage of the selling price. Hmm. Because, like, look at how many pizzas you can make in an hour. Yeah, the volume is definitely well. You make sixty pizzas, you make ten. You still make eight seventy five. Yeah, but then there's Surf other scenarios. Value. There's there's Surf other scenarios value. where maybe the percentage isn't as big as the. No, but I mean, like, yo, if you do 10% of the work, you get 10% of the profit. Like, there you go. How would you do that for... Um, I guess I'm just thinking about scalability. You know, I don't know. I, 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 know, I know fictional scenarios that are made up and fair to the people in my head. <laughs> I have no idea how this sorts out. Uh, I am... I'm alarmingly early in my academic career, but I will have an answer for you in the next 10 years. Yeah, man. It's uh there aren't too many worlds or countries out there that are um, good examples for how these ideologies would work. I, I know there's a few out there, but like uh, the hybrid socialist democratic system of, I think it's Sweden or Denmark. I know one of them has, that's kind of a hybrid solution that's working where it's like um, there's still a public solution, but there's still a private sector. For example, I think the best example is our school system right now. There is a public school system, but then should you choose to pay for it, there's also a private school system. You can take public transportation, but should you choose to pay for it, you can buy a car. Right. So there is all that. All that would be great if public, if private schools weren't siphoning off the funds from public schools, and they are. So, no, oh, I don't know how that works. So I can't. Charter speak schools, on. Betsy DeVos. Oh, uh, I know about the charter thing. Same shit. Oh uh, shit! I, I just I assumed that they were privately funded the same way. Like if you buy a car, it's a, a private purchase. Um, but it'd just be education that you're buying privately instead of no, you know, no. There's de there de I mean, and it's like there's a whole thing about how private schools siphon off public public funds. Hmm. I'll look into it. Yeah, it's alarming. Wow. Well, I guess there's going to be flaws there, but um, yeah, I think having that hybrid solution where there's a public option, and then should you choose. You can go private too. If like if it's not working for you, I think that'd be a good solution for public health care. If the private one doesn't work I, for you, go ahead and buy the buy the buy the bot shit. <laughs> I mean, that is that's only under the assumption that private schools should be better than public schools. Public schools yes, should that's a big be assumption. the best schools. They should be the best schools. The most accessible one should be the best one. I mean, in the a perfect one, world. Yeah. But uh, I mean, oh, we shit. my my pods are dying. Ooh, yeah, it's been a long one. I didn't anticipate this. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's been good though. Tell yeah, you that. <laughs> man. Any, anytime, we should do it more often. Hell yeah. Well, Justin, thanks.
for uh, going above <laughs> and beyond on this planning. I don't think we did any planning. I, well, at least I told you about it. <laughs> <laughs> Come March, anyway, we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll look at case numbers and and we'll figure that out. I think I think right now it would be smart to put the planning on a remote. See how good we can make a remote thing. Yeah, yeah, I really Just like the idea. See of how the good we can thing. make it. Yeah, dude. I mean, Carol's not getting on. Who else? Like, if you if you move to a remote scenario, who else could be involved? So many more people. Oh shit! Yeah, dude. Um, so, like, are you really going to stake the success of this on people's ability to travel to Orange County on a Saturday? I don't think that's necessary. Yeah, I'll bring that to Yumi's attention too, because that's a that shit that that hybrid session where it's like happening here, but you get a link type shit, but it's still like it really happened in person. Or not in person, but like the the conversation really happened. I mean, dude, just do it like webinar style where like we all speak like individually as speakers and then do a panel. So we just address the crowd in person. Oh, okay. Yeah, that works too. Uh, That's a, I'm not sure if crowd participation was going to be a thing. No, no, not, not like participation, but just like we speak about the, the gallery, right? Our own Mm -hmm. thing for like 10 minutes. And then we all like do a little round table after that in context. So it's live. So it has a live thing. And then we can show a pre recorded thing. We can give them a link to a pre recorded thing. Oh, okay. That's... Yeah. I, I think that if, if you just, if you make the plan to do it remote, we can like build so many cool like takeaways and things that people can like get into, like participation and, yeah yeah that's dope uh there's definitely more possibility in the remote setting for sure uh i guess i'll run it by yumi um yeah for sure tight well all right bud stay safe out there likewise I'll, i'll talk to you soon see you later peace